Brother Nubal Bhav, he has been the backbone of this masjid ever since it has been established, ever since I have known him, since 1999. Please, Brother Nubal Bhav. <coughs> Assalamu alaikum and peace be upon everyone joining us this evening. On behalf of Muslim Huda with the Islamic Center, its community and the board, I would like to welcome everyone this evening to our annual Interfair Dinner. It is an honor to be a part of Schomburg Hoffman Allergy Associations and to bridge the gap between our faith with events such as this. Tonight is not only about remembering our common ground but celebrating our differences as well. Before we proceed, I would like to thank of your special guests joining us this evening. Laurie Nawak, DuPage County Board Commissioner. Bob Picker, Chairman of the Democratic Party of DuPage County. Michelle Musnan, State Representative District 56. Paul Consman, Campaign Manager for Tammy Duckworth. Rich Jacob, District Director of Senator Michael Mullen. Deborah Bullwinkle, Villa Park Village President. Sue Walton, Community Activist. Ira Corral, and Opa Village Clerk, Judge John Dalton, 16th Judicial Circuit Court, Kent County, Gerald Bromley, Chamber Library Trustee, Mike Kuros, DuPage County Sheriff Candidate, Jean Kozmarek, DuPage County Clerk Candidate, Tariq Manhas, former Chief Financial Officer of Cook County, Nasir Jahagir, Second Chair Democratic Party of DuPage County, Zainab Khan, Press and Media Coordinator for Lauri Nawak, Dr. Ashish Singh, President of Indo American Democratic Organizations. I'd also like to remind everyone to ask questions during the tonight event. Communication is the key to better understanding one another. And we encourage everyone to ask any questions they have. Thank you again for coming. Enjoy. Thank you. I particularly would like to recognize Fred Cristo. He is a friend of the community. He has done so much for us. And I would like to have some of the guests come and speak a little bit. First of all, I want to ask Alan Eaton. He is the patriarch of our clergy association. I always look forward to this. I know we all do. We get together to talk about this is a wonderful night. Several years ago, at one of our monthly clergy associations that happened to be meeting at my home, my wife and I sponsored and had the clergy come. We had this man show up, his first clergy council association, meeting at our house. And I that night I thought to myself, for a little farm boy from Missouri, I certainly have come a long way. <laughs> I've had wonderful relations and hope to for the rest of my life with this congregation. I serve as chaplain with Schomburg and Hoffman Police Departments. And right after 9-11, the chief of Schomburg called me in. And he said, Alan, I got a problem. And I said, what's the problem? He said, the FBI has asked me to interview 11 families in Chamber, who unfortunately all had the last names of the pilots of the planes. He said, I've had my officers look, not one, of the families has ever had a moving violation or a parking ticket. And the first thing they're ever going to know about Schaubert Police Department is we're coming in and questioning them about terrorism. And I said, well, Chief, I said, I know some people at the mosque. Would you like me to talk to the mosque and see if some of their people would go with you? He said, you do? He said, that'd be awesome. So I called and you guys went. And it made a horrible situation turn out great. The people felt not threatened. Our police department learned so much. And you'll be pleased to know 
that as of about six months ago, we have our first Muslim police officer in Schaumburg. Now, isn't that something? And our fast moving to number two. Number two is on the list, so as soon as we have another opening, number two will be coming. So, isn't that great? So, I bring greetings from the clergy. Um, we get to do wonderful things. One last little story. We do a Thanksgiving service together at Prince of Peace Lutheran Church. And I always say that we ought to have every news bureau in Chicago cover this thing. But you know, they won't because it's not newsworthy. Because we don't shoot anybody. Right? But I never will forget one of the first times that the mosque had people other than some of the leaders that came. There was a young man out in the hallway and he was shivering like he was having a seizure. And I got this guy to go with me. And he had been told as a child that if he ever stuck foot in a Christian church, he would die. And there he was in the foyer of a Christian church and he didn't want to die, but he wanted to go in too. And so, he don't got him to come in and he felt at home and he stayed and ate pie and had a ball. <laughs> so, welcome from the clergy. We're glad you're in our community and we pray that we will continue to dialogue one with the other and learn the wonders of the marvelous God we serve. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Now we'd like to call upon Michelle Nussman. She is our state representative of Block 56. Miss Michelle. She is a friend of the community. I hope hard for her to get re-elected. Uh, thank you. I am very happy to be here. Um, he is right, this is one of my favorite events, and I'm happy to be able to bring many members of my family out tonight, my husband and two of my boys. Um, the mosque has been a wonderful part of the community, and it's been a great way to introduce people who are not familiar with the Muslim faith to the community. We had our farmers visiting from downstate earlier in the year, and they came up. Um, I have brought some friends who are visiting from Uganda. We have Davis and Monica. They are coming to learn a little bit about their faith tonight, and then we have another group of ladies visiting Pat Littinger, and a number of women who come out to learn a little bit more about your organization also. So this event in particular has been an amazing way to bring in lots of people from the community and, and you know, as Roberta even had said, find out that we're not so very different and it's okay in ways that we are. So I'm really happy to be here tonight. I look forward to getting to see a lot more of you and I certainly look forward to the feasting later on. So thank you. Thank you, Michelle. I want to welcome Fred Fisco. Please come and use a few words. Fred has been a very good friend of ours. He helped us to get the, the several different permissions for this mansion. Thank you, Fred, for coming. So. Thank you, Asami. I'll tell you, this is so much better than being in Springfield. I'll quit it any time. Um, and just for those of you who don't know me, I represent the 44th district, which includes all the parts of Schaumburg, Hoffman Estates, Streamwood, Hanover Park, Ogden, and Bartlett. And, and a real quick story that I've, I've mentioned before, one of the reasons I'm here as, as elected official is because of the support I've received from the South uh, Asian community in my district. Uh, I ran for trustee in Hoffman Estates like eight or nine years ago, and uh, it was the first time I got involved in politics. And I met a good friend, a safer, who's around here, who, uh, who, who approached me and said, Fred, we met, we just got along, we hit it off, right off the bat. He said, Fred, we want to help you, but if you do win and become a trustee in Hoffman Estates, can, can you help us get a cricket field? I mean, well, you know what, I, I can't promise anything, but if I do get elected, I'll see what I can do. Well, I, I did win, and I won in great part because of support I did receive from that community, uh, and I'm proud of to say that we do have a cricket field in the Hoffman Estates. 
And the support has been so great that I told folks at one time I even considered changing my name from Fred Presto to Fred Patel. <laughs> my wife didn't think it was a good idea. But, but I, I want to thank you, Dr. Sun. I want to thank the board of directors at the mosque for, for opening your doors and allowing us to break bread and have this dialogue. Uh, I'm very proud of the Northwest suburbs. I think we've adapted very well to change. Uh, I want to also recognize uh, Pastor Lisa uh, Lopez uh, from Christ Presbyterian Church, and I'm proud to announce that we open what we call a welcoming center in Hanover Park at the church. And this is an office where immigrants will be able to go there and become the one-stop shop to get any type of services they need that they can't find anywhere else. I want to also recognize Hanover Park and Aporan for, for being uh, uh, helping with that as well. Uh, we also are going to open a training center in conjunction with Elgin Community College and Harvard College in Hanover Park to also help this immigrant population that comes in that needs those services to just advance. Uh, my office is located in Streamwood. You're more than welcome. It's easy to find. Uh, my name is, uh, a big sign of my name, Fred Patel. Fred Crespo. <laughs> but uh, Chairman, thank you very much. Thank you all for, for coming and joining us as well. Now, we have to call upon a great friend of our community, someone who organizes the Muslim events in her township, Ira Kerr. Please come. Assalamu alaikum. I want to thank you so much, Dr. Sammy, and all of you for having me uh, here at your mosque. Um, this is, I think, my fourth or fifth iftar with you, and I have to tell you that um, I've learned a lot and I've made great friends. And um, when you first, my first iftar, you talked about ignorance. And I've, I've always been open to diversity and inclusion, and it's been a big part of my leadership journey. But when you talked about it like that, it really has opened my eyes and has given me the opportunity to engage more in learning more about what I don't know and recognizing my own ignorance. So in the last four years, I've attended every iftar. This time I did too, with Charmin. And I've built, built great friendships and I have a great place in my heart for this mosque and I always talk about it and it's such a great place for our community members to engage in their faith. So we're proud to have you as neighbors and as State Rep. Fred Presto said, we in Hanover Park, uh, we're like a hot spot. We're all over the place, right? We have our welcoming center coming in August, and that really um, symbolizes what Hanover Park is. It's a community of a very diverse residents. We come from all over the world. Our schools speak over 60 languages in some schools. And we're very proud of our diversity, and we want people to come and join our community and integrate. The same with uh, Reverend Lisa Lopez, who has opened her doors to our community, and not just in Hanover Park, but in all of your communities, in your neighbors' communities, your friends' communities, your family's communities. Hanover Park is a regional home, and we're very open to diversity. And it's thanks to the leadership of Governor Quinn and State Rep. Presto and Michelle Musman that we have the opportunity to have this welcoming center. And particularly Fred, because he made sure we had that those funds for this welcoming center. So thank you so much for having me, and I hope that you will all come to our welcoming center. Thank you. Thank you very much. I again want to recognize Lisa Lopez. She has invited me to her church. I had had to go there to give a talk. Last but not the least, a dear friend of mine sitting in the back, I want to call Rabbi Cohen. Please come. By the way, Torin, our guest speaker is very interested in Judaism. Good evening, everyone. It is uh, so wonderful to be here at this iftar tonight, and uh, what an honor to be invited. Uh, this is a week where uh, my wife and I had our first child. And <laughs> Very, very excited. I am on paternity leave, but I said, there is no way that I'm going to miss this. And I am so happy to be here. It is uh, it's such an honor. And um, let me just say that what a privilege it is to live in an area where uh, we have such deep friendships 
um, friendships between Muslims and Christians and Jews, and we have opportunities to dialogue and to learn from each other as uh, a part of the Abraham Salon and a number of other conversations that we have over the course of the year. And in this rough and tough world, we need friends, and I am so grateful for the friends that we have, and I bring greetings from all of the Beth Tikva congregation, and um, peace unto all of you. Salam Aleichem, Shalom Aleichem. Thank you very much. Have, as I've established a tradition to make an opening statement, and then I will introduce the guest speaker. On behalf of the Muslim community of Masjid al-Huda, I would like to welcome all of you this evening. In spite of the weekday, you took care and you took the trouble to come and visit us. Ramadan is the month during which Holy Quran was revealed to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. This is the month first First, first and foremost, we come closer to God by fasting in obedience to His command. This is an incredible special time for, of the year for 1.5 billion Muslims in the world for charity, for contemplation, and community. First of all, Islam is all about charity. This is one of the things what Islam is all about. According to a British report, many other Many of Muslim, Muslims all over the world give more to charity than any other faith-based group. Right here in Chicago land, last year, Muslims have given over $400,000 to feed food pantries, provide scholarships to needy students, paid rent and utility bills, needy families, and supported halfway and domestic abuse shelter. This year's target is over half a million dollars to be raised and collected and spent to the poor people in Chicago land. This is besides what Muslims give overseas to support the poor in their homeland. During Hajj period, tons of sacrificial meat is distributed in the poor families of Chicago. According to Chicago Tribune report, Muslims are the biggest donor of meat to the poor in this area. During Thanksgiving, Muslims of the city distribute hundreds of turkeys to the media families so that they can enjoy their joyous occasion with their families and friends. Second, Ramadan is the time of contemplation. The first of all, all day we fast and pray all night and think deeply about others. By experiencing hunger and thirst, we become more compassionate, become more compassionate to those who have no choice throughout the year but to experience hunger and thirst. A billion of brothers and sisters in humanity who Quran calls children of Adam are hungry every day. During Ramadan, especially we ask ourselves, what are we doing to change this injustice? Third, Ramadan is also a time of increased fellowship with our Muslim brothers and sisters as we attend the masjid more frequently for night and prayer and worship. We remember those who are ill, otherwise unable to attend the congregational prayer. Muslims visit those brothers and sisters and see how they can relieve some of their burdens. During this holy month, Muslims do not forget our many non-Muslim neighbors and fellow citizens who have done so much to support us, especially in, in the past few difficult years after 9-11. Our religious freedom is guaranteed by our Constitution and Bill of Rights. But it is the conscience of so many people like you that, that brought this, this, this political document to freedom into life by standing with us the time of our difficulties. It is because of this Muslim community in this country enjoys our rights in this great nation of ours. The religious pace of our planet is changing at a dramatic pace. More religions of earth are becoming multi more regions of the earth are becoming multicultural and multi-faith societies. Root of this phenomenon is the international pattern of immigration due to lack of personal liberties, severe human rights violations, and economic deprivation in their homelands. Throughout the past century, the world movement of the people during, along with their faith and culture has created a situation that is new to the human race. Modern gen age and means of past travel has added to make this world a multi-ethnic, multicultural, and multi-faith, a big global village. As a result, different cultures and different faiths have come face to face. That is also new in the human history. People who migrated here earlier and living for some time might feel that the boundaries of their faith and their culture are under threat by new immigrants. 
I came to understand with certainty. When people are angry and fearful of each other, the only thing that can dispel this fear and hate is not to, not to look at the statistics, not to watch news media, not by hearing gossip, but meeting people face to face, try to get to know each other. To alleviate this feeling of hate and fear, we welcome our neighbors into our homes, into our masjid to share in our fast breaking. As we give thanks to God Almighty for all of these things that He has made possible for us. Main aim of inviting all of you is to share the spirit of joy of Ramadan with our friends and non-Muslim neighbors and take this opportunity to inform and educate our non-Muslim fellow citizens about Islam that is so that have, so that the chasm, the gulf that exists among different groups of people can be removed and the fear of unknown exists can be alleviated. Events of this kind are extremely helpful in bringing people closer and develop better understanding of each other's faith and viewpoint. Before I introduce the keynote speaker, I would like to have one housekeeping note that before five minutes of, of the iftar, I'm calling for the, I want the guests to take and go to the uh, uh, appetizers and fill up their plates so that when the azan comes, that we are ready to eat. Our keynote speaker, Imam Michael Abdul Malik Ryan, grew up in Oak Park. He is a local man, local boy. The son of two teachers, he developed a deep affection for books and learning of all kinds. A devout graduate, he accepted Islam in 1994 and was part of founding of UMA organization, that is United Muslim Moving Ahead, a default as well as Inner City Muslim Action Network. He graduated from Georgetown University Law in 1998 and worked for 14 years as an attorney and guardian at Latin in the Cook County Child Protection System, which is a volunteer program appointed by the court of the court to represent the interests of infants, children, the unborn, the incompetent adults in legal actions. Imam Abdul Malik has also worked with Iman in a variety of capacities, from volunteer to president of the board of directors, served as Imam of the Inner City Muslim uh, Islamic Center in South New City neighborhood. He has studied Islam with a variety of teachers and currently continues his studies in Islam through Al Maghrib Institute based in USA, Canada, Great Britain, Malaysia. Imam Abdul Malik is also interested in Irish culture and language and in community religion, especially Islam and Judaism. As associate director of the Office of Religious Diversity at DePaul, his responsibility includes assessment and strategy, serving as chaplain of the School of New Learning and Muslim Life. He blends perfectly his spiritual and worldly life. Imam Abdul Malik lives in the South suburb with his wife Muna, who is also a DePaul graduate and their four lovely children. Without further ado, I present our keynote speaker, Imam Abdul Malik. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Khalid, and thank you everyone for being here uh, and for your uh, beautiful remarks Remarks to welcome us all here. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. We begin in the name of God, the most compassionate, the most merciful. I wanted to begin with a brief uh, hadith, uh, just to talk about, I was trying to think, how can I explain or how can I convey how important Ramadan is to the Muslims and how important, how much value we put on it. And uh, one of the close companions of the Prophet Muhammad was named Talha. Talha ibn Ubaidullah may Allah be pleased with him. And for Muslims, we believe that the, the best of people are those people who were companions of the prophets, those who, who spent time with the prophets. So whether it's the disciples with Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him, or the companions with, with Prophet Moses, or any of the, the people who uh, of course, there can be righteous people in every time. There can be saints and friends of God in every time. And we know there are some in our time, and there may be some in this room. But the, those who have the opportunity to have that close companionship with prophets, they have a special merit to them. And, and in the Muslim tradition, we really stress that, and we call them sahab, or companions. And what we're stressing there is that one of the things that makes them so special is that companionship they had with the prophets and the relationships that people have together. And that's something that we try to continue in our tradition, is to have those kind of relationships between teachers and students and between different people in the community. 
But Talha ibn Ubaidullah, one of the companions of the Prophet Muhammad, he narrates the story that he said that I had saw two people from the tribe of Bali. Two people from this tribe, I saw them and they came to the Prophet and they became Muslim at the same time. They both came together and they became Muslim at the same time. Then life went on and one of them was one of those people who strives really hard. Like you always used to see him doing good deeds, helping people, praying and all these things. And then eventually he even got to the point where he was martyred for the sake of his faith. He ended up losing his life, sacrificing his life for the sake of his faith. The other one that had accepted, uh, became Muslim at the same time as him, that he was a good Muslim but he didn't do anything extra special as this guy. And he didn't, and then he eventually, uh, one year after the first man died, the second man died. So Talha said that these were these two men. And then Talha, he said that he had a dream. He said he had a dream and in his dream he saw Jannah, he saw heaven. And there was someone at the gate of Jannah letting, guiding people in. And he said that the, he saw the man, the man who died second, the man who didn't strive as hard, the man who didn't seem as special, he saw him enter paradise first. Then the second man, he saw enter paradise. Then Talha came to the door, and the man said, it's not your time yet, go back. And so he woke up. And Talha woke up and he began telling people his dream. He began telling people, this is what I dreamed. And the word spread to the Prophet, peace be upon him, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And Prophet Muhammad said, it's, he called the people together and he said, it seems that all of you are amazed by Talha's dream. Why are you so amazed by it? And they said, of course, what amazes us is why did the man who we know who was strove so hard and did so much, why did he go into the heaven first before the other man in Talha's dream? And the Prophet Muhammad said, didn't the second man, didn't the man who entered paradise first, didn't he live one more year? Didn't, Ram didn't he get to go through one more Ramadan? Didn't he get to fast that whole month? Didn't he get to pray all those nights? Didn't he get to give so much in charity? He said the difference between the two of them is the difference between heaven and earth. So this is what the Prophet, peace be upon him, was stressing about the value of Ramadan and the importance of Ramadan and how many acts of worship we can engage in. And so you see Muslims, when the month of Ramadan came, comes, of course we have equivalents, we have the high holidays in Judaism or we have you know, the Christmas and Easter in, in the Christian tradition. We all know that there's, there's times of the year when it brings everybody out. You know, Even the people who may do whatever during the year, but this time brings them out. And that happens in Ramadan too. But for me as a Muslim, it seems especially special for the Muslims that it goes on for a whole month. It's not just one day, it goes on for a whole month. And you will come to the, to the mosques every single night, and I'm sure any of you who drive around here will see the parking lots full every single night. And you will see the people coming and praying every single night. And to me it was amazing when I first began to see how the mosque would be more full on these nights of Ramadan than any other time during the year, even than they are during the Friday congregation sometimes. And people come and it's coming for these night prayers is not, it's not a joke, it's not a light matter. Uh, you're basically standing listening to the Quran being recited for two hours. And the, for many of the people, they don't even necessarily understand everything that's being recited. But the, the blessing and the value of it and, and, the, and the way it makes them feel closer to God is worth that much to them. And of course, for those of us who strive and try our hardest to learn the Arabic and to understand the Quran, then it's really an amazing experience to spend that month really feeling that you're in conversation with your Lord, that, you're, uh, that God is speaking to you every night, that you're going through all the amazing stories of the past and all the prophets, and you're going through some of the incidents from the life of the Prophet Muhammad, and you're going through visiting paradise, and visiting hellfire, and you're making prayer, and you're making supplication, and God is advising you and guiding you on how to live your life, and what's truly important. And so, one of the things that is truly important if we listen to the Qur'an, and you know, I had a whole speech made, but then when the brother recited the ayahs from Surah Al-Baqarah, I just came up with like 20 other things I wanted to talk about, just explaining and touching on so many beautiful points in those verses. And sometimes I think that's important because, of course, I could never say anything better or more important than what God is saying in the Qur'an. And I think it would be beautiful for all of us to get, get in touch with the Qur'an and to understand exactly what's being said. 
But then also I had so many other thoughts that came to my mind as the other remarks were being given. So I'm well aware of my time limits, so don't worry, I'll, I'll keep it down. But I, alhamdulillah. But I encourage people to keep, to, to ask questions because the question time was really beneficial because then we get to talk about what you all want to talk about rather than just what I want to talk about, which I love to talk about what I want to talk about, but uh, we want to have a matchup between the two. So, one of the things that we see if we look at the Qur'an in Surah Al-Ma'idah, and I thought about this whole tradition, and many of you refer to being part of this tradition which is springing up, especially here in the, in the United States, which I can only speak of because that's where I live, but I know also happens in other parts of the world, but it's especially becoming popular here, is this tradition of having these interfaith iftars, of having people invited to the masjid, of sharing meals with people. I had, you know, another iftar in the synagogue uh, last week, and I had a bunch of other events and we have you know the Muslim community iftars with Cardinal George and with that very different and I, I know some of you have been to more than one iftar already this year so we have this is a growing tradition and what in the Quran of course there's a couple of things which show us the importance and the beauty of this tradition and the first is that if you look in Surah Al-Ma'idah when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when God is talking about the Muslim red legislation about like what meat we can eat and if all of you know the community, then you know, especially the Desi community here, especially the Indian Pakistani community, South Asian community, is very particular about the meat that they eat. May Allah reward them for that. And that's why we have in Chicago so many Zabiha Halal meat places and restaurants and everything, because people came and they're very strict about that issue. And they only eat meat that they believe is permissible for them to eat and that contains blessings in it. And but in all these, when, when you're looking in Surah Al-Maidah and all these legislations, and the point of me bringing this is not for the fiqh issue. Anyone who wants to discuss the fiqh, the Islamic law issue with me later, we can debate it later because there's some dis dis disagreements in the community about it. But the point in the Quran is that God says, after saying that, okay, you can't eat animals that die, they have to be slaughtered, they have to be slaughtered in a certain way, you can, you can eat this from the sea, these type of animals, you cannot eat pig, all these legislation is laid down. And then God says, the meat, the food, ta'am, the food of the people of the book is permissible for you, and your food is permissible for them. The food of the people of the book is permissible for you, and your food is permissible for them. Now, of course, we know if you ask, uh, it's not necessarily the case, again, from the legal perspective, from the religious law perspective, maybe an Orthodox Jew would not find Zabiha meat to be permissible for him. And he wouldn't find the Quran maybe to be a source telling him whether it is or not. And similarly, some Muslims, because of various issues, would say that, you know, the meat of the, that we just get from the average grocery store here in America, even though it may come from Christians, that it doesn't meet all the conditions that it's supposed to meet in terms of how it's slaughtered and is the blessing said when it's slaughtered and stuff like that. So, as I said, the law issue is a separate matter. But the commentators ask, why would God say this? Especially, why would God address the other people and say, your meat is permissible for them? Of course your meat is permissible for them. If this is the book of the Muslims. Or, and why would he make the point of the going both ways? And so they said that obviously that one of the deep wisdoms in this, for anyone who reflects, is that God is telling you that you should eat with people of other faiths, and you should share meals with them, and you should sit with them. And that, well, these food law issues that we take very seriously should not be a barrier or a burden to you feeling that, oh, we only eat with Muslims, or we only socialize with Muslims, or that they're a way to block people out. That's not the case. That's not the Islamic perspective, and that's not the Quranic perspective. And we all know that the importance of sharing meals and the importance of those type of relationships with each other is extremely important. You know, there's a recently, uh, you know, I was reviewing a recent study of the Pew Research Center about Islam religion in America, and I found a couple of interesting things that kept coming to my mind as we had the earlier presentations. First, they ask everyone who answers this to give like a temperature reading of like, what do you think of, of uh, then they give you a religious group like, what do you think of Catholic, zero to 100, give me a number. Okay, and they ask everybody, what do you think of evangelicals? What do you think of Jews? What do you think of Buddhists? What do you think of Hindus? They ask all, what do you think of atheists? They ask people all these questions. And then they total it all up into an average as to like, what's the average view 
that people in America have of different religious groups. And they found that, so this is the temperature scale, 0 to 100 again. They found that the average rating for Catholics, Evangelicals, and Jews is all like 60, 61, 62, all in that area. And of course, a big part of this for Catholics and Evangelicals is that they are the two largest groups in this country. And generally, people rate them, their own group the highest. Okay, so generally people are positive about their own group and give it high rankings. So if you're in a group that has a lot of people, your ranking will naturally go up. Um, they did have, you know, an interesting, it's interesting to see, especially given the history, not only in our world, but even in, in this country of anti-Semitism and of anti-Jewish feeling, that at this point, the numbers that you'll get are pretty warm for the way people feel about Jewish people. Doesn't mean that anti-Semitism doesn't still exist, and it doesn't mean there aren't complicated political reasons about why, for example, Jewish, Jewish people are rated very highly, they say in the poll, by evangelicals, but Jewish people don't necessarily rate evangelicals very highly in return. <laughs> but that's a whole different issue, and a lot of that politics come into that. But of course, for groups like Jewish and Muslim, our percentage of the population is so low that what we think of other groups doesn't affect this overall number that much. Um, so, the point though is that, so those groups are around 60, 61, 62, and then Muslims and atheists were 40 and 41. They were the lowest groups. That the general perception of people in America, if you give a general number, the lowest groups is uh, Muslims and atheists. So, the, uh, one of the things, if you look deeper into trying to understand why this is, and this, alhamdulillah, is not the case for all the people here today, and that's why we need to keep doing more of these events and keep expanding it beyond just the few people that reach out to these type of events, but find ways to reach out to more people. But I'm sure this wouldn't be true if you took the poll, say, in Ch the Chicago area. We live in a different type of community with different type of values and stuff, for the most part, alhamdulillah. But for example, if they ask people in America, two-thirds of the people in America still say, I do not know any Muslims. Two-thirds of people in America say, I don't personally know any Muslims. Now, whether that's even true, I don't know. Maybe they just don't know that they're a, they're a doctor or the guy at the gas station or the guy that drove their cab is Muslim. I don't know. But there are, definitely that is not a reality that makes sense here in like urban areas of the country or in university settings or other places like that. But there are, there are parts of the country where that is less the case, where they're less diverse, where you may not know people Muslim, or certainly people who are maybe not openly Muslim. And so that is a, obviously the best way to go about addressing that. So actually that's good in a way. If people have a negative viewpoint, I hope it's based on them not knowing us rather than them knowing us. Uh, if people have a negative viewpoint based on knowing us, which some people could, because we know we have problems in our community like every other community, then that has to be addressed in a certain way. But if it's a negative that they just don't know us and all they know is what they hear on the news, which is a negative story about this or that, or it seems to be that Muslims are always fighting overseas, or Muslims are always involved in wars, or the only contact the United States has with Muslims is in the lens of war, then, of course, that is understandable. But that can be remedied if they get to know people in person, if they get to know their neighbors, if they get to see the positive contributions that Muslims make to their community, if they get to see the commonalities that people have. And so that is extremely important. It's also extremely important all that was stressed among the people that we have to come together, we have to preach learning about each other. This is why Allah says in the Quran, in the famous verse from Surah Al-Hujarat, which is the other Quranic proof that these type of gatherings are extremely loved by Allah and are extremely loved by God and are extremely encouraged for us, is that God said, that old people, I created you from a single male and female and made you into different, you know, tribes and communities. And uh, verily, the most beloved of you in the sight of God is the one with the most taqwa. Lita arafu, so that you may know one another. Why did I create you a nation of the tribes? So that may, you may know one another. So the beautiful thing, if you look at this verse, is that it sums up some of the key points that people were mentioning during their speeches. One, that we really are one human family, literally. We're one human family, and the Muslim in the Quranic view, we're Beni Adam. We all trace ourselves back to Adam. We're all, it's a matter of how close or how distantly you're related, but literally we are all related to each other in the Muslim Quranic worldview. We are all family members. And so we're really not that different. We're really essentially the same. We're part of the same family. Yet, then God says, but we made you into different communities and tribes, 
So that God is not saying that the differences that you see between you are not an accident though. They're actually something that God made and that God is okay with. It's not something we have to try to get rid of the differences between us or it's not something we have to be afraid of or ashamed of. It's actually something we should celebrate because it's something that God created for a purpose. But the purpose is not to make us fight against each other or not to make us hate each other or decide who's better than the other. But the purpose is to get to know one another. To get to know one another. And of course, we cannot get to know one another if we do not spend time with each other, if we do not sit with each other, if we do not talk to people we don't know. And I know for people like me who are naturally introverts, that's a difficult thing, you know? And so we have, mashallah, people in our community who are very outgoing and they love to meet people and they love to talk to people and they love to make relationships and those are so important people in our community. But for others of us, it's more difficult and we need to create environments and settings where they can do that in a more comfortable way. Of course, living in this environment, uh, one thing that people don't often reflect upon is that you don't need to have a special gathering in a house of worship that's called an interfaith gathering, but all of us in our everyday life is engaging in interfaith all the time, especially if we're Muslims, uh, or Jews, or some other minority religion. Almost every encounter we have with somebody is someone different than us. And in a place as diverse as the Chicago area, that's true for even uh, people who are Christians or people who from any other background, that they're constantly running into people who are different than them. And they don't sometimes pause to stop and think of it as being an interfaith encounter, and that's why sometimes interfaith has a bad name for some people. I know when I try to get my students excited about interfaith, there's some who are excited about interfaith. They're brought up to talk, I think that's important, and they really like it. A lot of them, they don't get it. They're like, why would we do interfaith? Like, it's just about putting on a show for people, or it's just about some PR thing, or, or they have a scary notion that it's about you know, debating with people or trying to prove who's right or who's wrong, and they say, we're not interested in any of that. So, but the point is that they don't stop to think that every class they have is an interfaith class, their friends that they have lunch with is people of different faith, and maybe they don't choose, or maybe they do choose to bring their faith constantly to the forefront, but we're trying to encourage them as someone who works in an office of religious diversity at a Catholic university, the largest Catholic university in the United States, we want to encourage people to not be afraid or shy to talk about their faith, to bring their faith to the conversation. I know a lot of times we'll have trainings even at a Catholic university where we allow the people to talk about diversity in the workplace and to talk about their own faith and stuff, and the employees are like, you know, uh, what? We get to like talk about this at work? Like I, I thought that was like bad manners or that's not allowed or something, you know. No, I mean, of course there's proper ways and improper ways and we teach people about what's comfortable and what makes people uncomfortable and what's not appropriate, but these are manners that you have to have as a human being about any subject. But there's nothing that should say that your faith, and for those of us whose faith is so important to us, it really is an, an impossible task to try to tell you to Pre pre present a, a version of yourself without the most important thing in your life taken out when you meet people. Then you're creating a superficial environment. Then you're creating a where you're not really meeting the person. So it's very important that we take advantage of that to get to know each other. And the, and the last thing is that what we should do really, once we get to know each other, is not just make each other feel good. That's good. We could make each other feel good, eat food and whatever. But of course, as people who you know, believe in God, who fear God, who follow the way of the prophets, I would say that it's clear that what we should then do is serve the poor amongst us, serve the strangers amongst us, serve the left out amongst us, serve the oppressed amongst us. And we should use that power of coming together across different groups of people, across uh, different faith traditions, across different backgrounds and different histories, and we should use it to really magnify that power to come to the aid of those people who are in need of aid in the system. Not to come to the aid of people who are, you know, already comfortable and already powerful and already have it, but to come to the aid of the people who are really in need of our help. So this is what all of our traditions taught. This is what all of our prophets taught. All of our prophets taught came as friends and champions of the poor. There's, they did not come to defend the oppressors or to defend the wealthy or to defend anything else, but they came to defend those people in the lowest part of society and to give them hope, and to give them honor, and to give them human dignity. And so that should be our purpose. And that's the only way that we will find our dignity as human beings. So, 
Ramadan is a beautiful time, as I mentioned. It's a beautiful opportunity. You know, we all have times in our life. It's all the nature of human life is that we forget. The nature of the human being, we forget. The nature is that other things take over our mind. That we don't always think about what's important. That we need to be reminded. That we need to pause and reflect. So times like Ramadan come to again encourage us to rethink, to focus ourselves, to face, to, to turn back to what's truly important, to think about these principles, to think about what is our purpose here on this life. One of the beautiful things that uh, one of the Ibn al -Jo Ibn Jozi, not Ibn al Jozi, Ibn Jozi, he was a Hanbali scholar who was like very well known for his khutbas, for his sermons that he used to give. I used to give these sermons in Baghdad and there would be so many people there. And he was famous for coming up with these sermons. And one of his famous sermons talking about the month of Ramadan, all of us here are from the Jewish, Judeo-Christian traditions are familiar with the story of Yusuf, right? The story of Joseph. And he said, he came up with a sermon where he discussed that Ramadan is to Allah like Joseph was to Jacob. So like, jo like Jacob had 12 children and there's 12 months in the year that the most beloved month of the year to God is Ramadan. And Ramadan is his favorite out of the twelve. Just like that. And they said if you take it longer, you can see that just like, just like Joseph was, what was Joseph's attitude toward his brothers? When his brothers betrayed him, when his brothers did amazingly evil things to him, but then his brothers, but then when he came and had the upper hand over them, what did he do? He was forgiving and lenient and merciful to them. And they said that this should be the way that a person is during Ramadan. Ramadan is the month of graciousness. Ramadan is the month of mercy. Ramadan is the month of compassion. So that all of us as Muslims, and all of us who want to join in the spirit of Ramadan, we should have the spirit during the month of Ramadan, the spirit of Joseph, peace be upon him. And secondly, that Joseph, even when he was a boy in the Quranic story, he used to try to, he used to, try to make up for the faults of his brothers. And he used to try to cover for their faults and help them with things. And they said similarly that Ramadan covers up for the faults and makes up for the sins and shortcomings of our other 11 months of the year. That we should use Ramadan to try to make repentance and to try to turn back and get forgiveness for the mistakes that we make and the shortcomings that we have in the other 11 months of the year. And... There's one more point. So, Joseph, similarly, the month of Ramadan, in any event, the month of Ramadan is the month that makes up for those other months and helps us come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, peace be upon him, on that note, they said that the Prophet Muhammad, when they were describing him, they said that he was the most generous of all people. And I liked what Dr. Khalid said, and mashallah, growing up here, and I'm not saying this just because I grew up as a Catholic and work in a Catholic school, but for example, Catholics and all, all people, there are so many groups in this society that are very generous, mashallah, and they're very established, and the Muslims are trying to become established. But I will say, and especially those other communities, they tend to have it more institutionalized. And they have people who have been here longer and have larger you know, sums of wealth, and there's different things that go on. I know my my sister works for the Big Shoulders Fund, which raises money for Catholic schools in the in the inner city of Chicago. And uh, you know they have a fundraiser, and they raise like you know 100 million dollars and all this kind of stuff. So they they have people that have mashallah a lot of money, and they give it for a good cause, which is serving. By the way, the Catholic schools in the inner city of Chicago, the vast majority of the students are not Catholic. They are still it was a Catholic school system built to serve Catholics at a time when they didn't feel comfortable in the public school system, but that is preserved now basically in many places as a as this public service to people who need an alternative to public school systems that don't work. And so it's a it's a beautiful way of contributing to the society that the Catholic Church does. And all those who contribute to it, whether they're Catholic or non Catholic. But so there's all these examples. But I will say that just like the prayers of the Muslims when I begin to spend time around the Muslims and the prayers of the Muslims in Ramadan, you can't help but be impressed by that. Similarly, you cannot help but be impressed by the generosity of the Muslims in Ramadan. And you come to these masajid, and I, I would go to the mosque in different places, and some of them every single night are fundraising for a different cause. 
and I would sit there and I would get scared and I don't have a lot of money and I, I want, but I know I'm supposed to be so generous in this time and I want to give. But I would look around me and keep seeing like so many people giving every single night. And I'm like, I know these people just gave last night and the night before and the night before and the night before. I'm like, where did these people get the money? But it's not a matter of getting the money, but it's a matter of trusting in God and being generous. And all of our religious traditions teach us that if we are generous, if we give sincerely for the sake of helping and serving others, that actually we don't lose any money. That, that that money stays with us and God replenishes it. And I'm sure many of us have seen this example in our own lifetime. I don't know if we know any people. I know I worked, you know, I worked in the with foster children. I worked uh, with a lot of people who have some of the worst life situations. No family, no place to live, you know, all these types of things. I never came across a person who, who was like homeless, asked how to get homeless. It's because I was giving so much charity. You know, I just gave too much money away and I ended up homeless. It never happened. It never happened. And God promises that does that charity does not decrease wealth. That, char that Allah, God replaces your charity, and even more importantly than whether God replaces it with wealth that you see in this world, that more importantly, every single thing you give is saved for the hereafter. As the Prophet uh, Muhammad, peace be upon him, he used to say, like, when sometime he got... Uh, a certain amount of meat and he had a certain meal to give and then his, he told his wife distribute it all to the poor you know and then he came and asked okay what's left and she said only this uh, leg is left this one leg is left and the prophet said no rather all the rest of it is left except for this thing all the rest of it is still left for us in the hereafter and we'll see the reward for that and it's only what we use on ourselves that that we truly use up in this world but everything else comes back to us and so, in the month of Ramadan, you see that generosity. And so they said that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he was the most generous of people at all times. And this is, I'm sure, the characteristic of all the Prophets. That no one ever asked him for something and he said no. He would give whatever he had to give to that person. Even though the Prophet was not in the habit of keeping wealth or being a rich man. In fact, if ever wealth came in, the Prophet would make sure to give it all away within a day or two of getting it. And sometimes he would run after prayer to his house to make sure that he got rid of all the money that he had in his house. And that doesn't mean everyone has to live that way. But the generosity of the Prophet was such, and it was not hard for him to do that, because the Prophet's heart was not attached to this world. So he loved to give away, because his heart was not seeking after this world. And part of Ramadan is trying to seek us to detach ourselves from this world, and to see that these things are not what we should be obsessed with or spend our time thinking about. But the nature and very process of fasting forces you to realize and get to a place where you feel closer to God. And though you realize, you go through a state where you realize your weakness, right? And first all you're doing is thinking about food. Now you're thinking about it being thirsty. And you're like, I realize how much I need this stuff. Like, this is not... But then you get to a point where that doesn't matter anymore. You're not thinking about that anymore. You're used to it and you realize that I can get by with much less than I get by with most of the time. That I don't need to be obsessed with this. That most of the time I'm just eating in our place that we live, in our society where we're blessed to have relative societal affluence. Most of us just eat for entertainment or we eat out of boredom. You know, every time we don't have anything else to do, we want to have something in our hand eating. And I'm, I'm one of them. I'm not saying other people. I know people know that if you saw me any time other than the month of Ramadan, there would be like two Coke cans of Coke in front of me that I had finished off since the gathering started. So, uh, and I love Coke, and it's not haram, so I know people don't like that, but I don't like that. No, so, it's not forbidden by God, so I shouldn't be ashamed of it, but I do love Coke. <laughs> but, the, uh, the point is that you pass through that stage, and then you realize, and, and so the lesson that I think we lose, you, you learn from Ramadan, is something that was said in a, in a statement by Ibn Atta'Allah, the famous Muslim scholar. And I think all of us would agree on this. All the people of faith would agree on this. I just lost my notes, so that's good because it's, time is up. But the, Ibn Atta'Allah, he said that I never try to do anything relying upon myself, relying upon my own ability and my own talents and my own arrogant thought that I can do this, except that I found it to be incredibly difficult. Everything I set out to do thinking that I'm going to do this because I have this talent or skill or I'm going to show these people or I have this education that everything I tried to do like that was difficult. But he said, I never sought to do something. I never tried to do a task 
relying only on God and God's help to accomplish it, except that I found it made easy for me. And so I think this is the month of Ramadan message for us. That we don't seek to rely on ourselves and our own greatness, but we realize our own weakness and realize we're all completely dependent on God. But once you realize that you're completely dependent on God, you find out that you can do things you never thought you could do. If you would have came to me 20 years ago before I was Muslim and told me, okay, this summer, this July, you're 17 hours a day, no water, no food, no nothing. Every single day. You can do that, right? I would say, no, I can't do that. I would say, no, it's impossible. And you know, I was not an unhealthy person. I was like, it. You know, a cross-country athlete, I loved running, I did a lot of these things. But I'm like, no, I can't do that. And what you find, in fact, and I'm sure if you ask all of the Muslims here, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has preserved our health and we're able to fast, everyone that I talk to you heard the same thing. Oh, how is fasting this month, you know, July? So long, all this stuff. They'll say, I found it to be very easy. I found it to be surprisingly easy. Increasing our faith, increasing our Iman, getting closer to God, and of bringing the community tighter together. And that's been my experience in different Muslim communities. From when I was a student at Nepal, that made me accept Islam, it was being around Muslims. And at that time there was like 12 Muslims, 10 Muslims, who were practicing. And they were... Uh, what impressed me and what won my heart over is that they were from every country, every different country. Like their parents came from every different country on earth. One was from parents who were from Egypt, one from Pakistan, one from Bangladesh, one from Kashmir, one from, you know, uh, Palestinian, one African American, everywhere, I was there, you know, Irish, everywhere from all over the globe, and we would just sit and unite and do this fast in Ramadan, then of course it was in the winter, so it was easy, even if you were used to it, it's very short, and then, but we come and beautiful and share, just bring different dishes and share and sitting on the floor and have that fellowship. And that's what really, and so you have different environments. You have environments where the iftars are very, you know, lively and very together. And you have environments like on the, where I used to live on 63rd Street in Chicago, where we come together. And you have the strangest different group of people coming that you might get when you uh, offer free food every night for a month on the south side of Chicago. And you start to get a strange group of people. But mashallah, beautiful group of people. And, but the thing about that group is that they would come and just sit in silence and eat. But there was still a feeling of warmth and beauty. At least for me, I don't know if other people would have liked it, but for me it was a feeling of so much warmth and offering each other food and stuff, but we didn't feel the need to talk to each other. We just sat and ate and had that experience. And then of course the prayers and everything. But I think what's beautiful about this gathering, and then I'll open up to questions, is that we expand that feeling of community beyond just the Muslim community. But that our whole community can feel, those of you who come out to stars year after year, those people that we can reach out to, begin to feel that you're part of this community as well. We're part of your community, that we have a larger community that also becomes stronger in Ramadan, and that we can be like the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. They said that he was the most generous of people all the time, and he became more generous in the month of Ramadan, until his generosity was like a breeze. It was like a breeze, and the beautiful thing about a breeze is that it touches everyone. It touches everyone. Even if you can't see it, everyone can feel the breeze. I know we would love a breeze right now in here, but alhamdulillah. The Prophet, peace be upon him, was like his generosity, was like a breeze that touched everyone, and that's how it should be. Where all the people in our communities, everyone out there should know, I don't know what's going on, but somehow it seems better at this month. It seems like people are nicer. It seems like people are giving me stuff. It seems like people are inviting me over, and then suddenly they'll realize, Oh, it's the month of Ramadan. And all of the people, the Muslims and the non-Muslims, they should feel that beautiful spirit. And that's what I want our Muslim community to try to do, to feel that beautiful spirit. Not to feel, oh, it must be the month of Ramadan because all of a sudden it's a traffic jam over there by Masjid al-Qadda every night. No. That, if that's, that's good if that's there, but that the beautiful and warm and spiritual feelings should spread across everyone like a gentle breeze. So thank you very much.